thing that is interesting, Willie Walsh, who I remind you is the Director General of IATA, the International yeah. Air Transport Association, he says some of the blame has to be directed at the fact that it now takes three months to get a security badge for a new airline employee or baggage handler in the UK when it was three to four weeks prior to the pandemic. Is that something the government could be providing help for? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. Good to talk to you. Look, um, the first thing to say is uh, we want to see uh, holidaymakers be able to go abroad. Actually, let's... You know, look for the positives here. We've got rising confidence in international travel, uh, which is a great thing after the pandemic and all that we've been through. Um, and, and that's a positive thing. Obviously, demand has surged as people feel more confident. We've supported the airline industry through COVID with £8 billion. So th- we have tried to hold their hand through what has undoubtedly been a difficult time. There have been, just to answer your question, uh, regulatory changes to help with things like staff recruitment. And we We can always look at smart, pragmatic ways to go further. But fundamentally, fundamentally, um, the travel companies, uh, in the way you describe, have got to take responsibility for their recruitment. And yes, there may be things that we need to help them with and we have helped them with. But but actually, the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, has been talking to them about this and about being braced for the resurgent demand for months. So I, I miss some of the finger pointing going on. Those are the facts. Now, that's on some of the front pages, Deputy Prime Minister. On many of the other front pages are the troubles in which the Prime Minister reportedly finds himself. And indeed, the own ethics chief, Lord Geit, the independent adviser, threatening to resign over the number 10 parties. How much trouble do you think the Prime Minister is in professionally? Look, it's been a difficult uh, patch and there's been all these distractions. I think in terms of Lord Geit, the Prime Minister's addressed the, the concerns that were raised in a letter. That's now in the public domain. Everyone has read that this morning, I think. And he's made the point that there was no breach of the ministerial code because... Uh, there was no in, uh, deliberate intention to uh, uh, breach the law in relation to the single gathering that he was uh, fined for. Um, uh, in terms of the, the broader situation, look, I, I think a lot of people have exhausted with this story. I think that, that I don't want to uh, diminish it. Um, the transparency and the accountability is important, but we're getting on with the job as a government. We had a £15 billion package uh, of support for the cost of living uh, announced um, in the last few days. That means a, a, a tax cut uh, on national insurance of £330 coming in July, uh, a cash uh, grant of £400 to deal with energy bills coming in October. We've got the ongoing situation in Ukraine. Right. I've been talking about crime fighting, uh, getting offenders into work, which I know is an interest to you. I think the most important thing for the government is to be getting on with the job. It's difficult, though, as the number of Conservative MPs publicly calling for the Prime Minister grows. How nervous are you that we might be looking at a no-confidence vote? Obviously not this side of the weekend, but fairly early this month. I, I, I think it's unlikely because... Uh, well, the why, over- why, Deputy uh, Prime Minister? The num- I mean, you're closer to it than I, obviously, but... Just to the layman, the numbers seem to be growing. Can I put it to you that some of them have to have greater influence? Dame Andrea Leadsom, these are heavy hitters within the party. There is a sense that the revolt is getting bigger almost by the day. Well, Andrea Leadsom, as far as I know, hasn't put in a letter of no no confidence. So uh, let me answer your question. I think that, of course, the media will pick up on these points and raise them, and it's perfectly legitimate to do so. But what we tend to ignore uh, in the media commentary is the overwhelming number of people, and there are over 350 Conservative MPs, and I speak to them daily, as you rightly say, who say to me uh, what their constituents want, what what I suspect your listeners want, is us to get the distractions to one side, not re-engage in months-long Westminster navel-gazing, which inevitably a leadership contest would bring into play, but address the public's concerns, which is what we're doing on the cost of living, on Ukraine, on crime fighting. And I think that's where our, all our energy should be. And I, I think that's right as a government. But as an MP, I think that's what uh, our constituents expect of us. So it is not a troublesome summer ahead for the Prime Minister and indeed for you as his deputy. Now, look, we'll deal with the challenges, but I think uh, we, we're the ones with the plan on the cost of living. I haven't seen a credible plan from the Labour Party. Uh, we're the ones, we, and the Prime Minister is the one showing the leadership on Ukraine. And when it comes to what we're doing in the summer, just to, again, but square it's, it's the not answer persuading your own fo- folk, Mr. Well, Rob. I, I hear what well, you I, say, I, and, I, you're, I, and you're a very eloquent, eloquent spokesman for your cause, but it's you're not even persuading your own colleagues at the moment. Well, I don't think that's right, because we only well, ever hear from the dissenting voices, but let 
me just explain why I think number. over the summer we should be not engaged in another round of Westminster internal debate with ourselves. But I've got, for example, um, a Bill of Rights uh, to put before Parliament to uh, overhaul the Human Rights Act. Uh, really important to strengthen free speech and uh, bring back some common sense into the system. I've got a victim's law. I've got parole reforms to make sure that we can properly protect uh, the, the, the public and uh, strengthen the powers to protect the public. I think these are the things which your viewers and our constituents think we should be focused on. So my, uh, my strong advice and thrust and all my energies are going into those bread and butter issues that I think people want to see us focused on. All right. You won't, I'm so, I imagine, have heard of the name of Colonel Shafiq Ahmed Khan. I take you to Afghanistan. The colonel was lured into a trap and shot dead on his doorstep earlier this week. He'd worked with Task Force 444, which I'm sure you know operated with UK Special Forces. He was a senior Afghan intelligence officer who'd worked, as I say, alongside British military. He'd had an application to come to this country, to Britain, because of repeated death threats, waiting since January of this year. It wasn't acted on. He was shot dead. Is this a failure of trying to get people out who helped? These are the ones we left behind. You were Foreign Secretary at the time, Mr Robb. Yeah, we got and we got out 15,000 in that August evacuation, which was the largest of its kind in living memory. Of course, uh, because of the scale uh, and the, the, the pace, I should say, of the Taliban takeover, um, uh, we didn't have the time to get everyone out and we've continued to work on that um, and I know that the MOD the Home Office and the FCDO have been working very closely on that but but don't I, I don't think we should take the responsibility of the Taliban I uh, agree for, uh, please I'm not uh, defending you know, their actions no I know I know this, this but we've done everything very we, brave we can man, Mr. Mr. Rob, Deputy Prime Minister this very brave man had been trying to come to this country since January Deputy Prime Minister he knew his life was at risk surely we could have moved swifter for the general well, I, I, so look, those cases, my heart goes out to them that Sorry, we Colonel. have, we, we've done everything we can to support those who supported us. That's right. I don't know the details of the case in the sense that um, whether the challenge was him getting out of Afghanistan uh, or whether it was processing on our side, as you say, I just don't know. But what we've tried to do is get the processing done as swiftly as possible. Um, uh, but of course, for anyone in Afghanistan, getting out of the country itself is a significant practical challenge. And we don't have any control over that. Uh, and lastly on this, <coughs> you, you can put your hand on your heart and say, as far as you're aware, the relevant authorities are doing everything they can to get out folks such as the Colonel and others who are sadly, and I'm not condoning, sadly under threat by the murderous Taliban. Yeah, of course, and uh, it's an enormous team effort, as I said, across the Home Office, the MOD, uh, which is particularly responsible for uh, the, the the Arab scheme and the, the, the effort to get those who worked for um, uh, UK forces um, or, or uh, other allied forces out. Uh, and, of course, the FCDO is working very hard on that as well. All right. Uh, last couple of questions. Do you concur with the Archbishop of Canterbury? It's time to forgive the Duke of York. I think he's entitled, given his spiritual role, to to say that. I, I just think, uh, given the circumstances around that, and as Justice Secretary, and uh, given uh, that there are ongoing uh, proceedings in relation to this, I, I don't think it would be wise for me personally to comment. Mm, OK. Do you want to see him on the balcony with his mum this weekend? I think that's a, a, an issue for the royal family, but I'm really looking forward to seeing Her Majesty the Queen, uh, particularly because she was, wasn't able to attend the, the, the Queen's speech. And I think, uh, you know, frankly, as we come through this pandemic, as the economy um, has got back up and running, as people are getting their lives back to normal, great to have a chance to bring the country together and to bring communities together. And I'm looking forward to the Jubilee celebrations and locally uh, we've got a whole range of them and I'm sure many people would really enjoy this opportunity. Let's hope we get some sunshine. Indeed, and I wish you and the good folk of Isha and Walton the best possible time there. Lastly, one global question. Your colleague Priti Patel is confident the first people who need to go to the Rwanda processing centres will go later this month. Do you share her optimism? Can you tell me now that people will be on those flights in just over a week or so's time, 10 days' time? 
I do share her uh, optimism and confidence. I know she's worked very hard on this. Um, and I think uh, it's important because it sends a message that you can't uh, automatically get here and stay here if you take those illegal routes. And we want to, and the National Nationality and Borders Bill is critical in setting up uh, clear rules. Uh, we want to welcome people to this country um, who come here lawfully. We've shown that on Afghanistan, on Hong Kong, uh, in relation to Ukraine. I think 115,000 visas uh, in relation to Ukraine alone. Uh, but we also have got to stop and stem the flow of people coming here illegally. The Rwanda flight and the first flight will help send that message. I hope you have enjoyable and dry celebrations in Eastern Walton. Thank you for your time. Deputy Prime Minister, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab, appearing here on LBC. We're at one minute after eight. News is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, leaders from the aviation industry have been asked by the Transport Secretary to explain how they plan to end the delays and cancellations facing passengers.